Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And now it's a big one. The top 50 best songs of 2022. I've said before that this is the list I look forward to making the most every year. That might be true even more so in 2022 than ever before. Because if I were to highlight a consistent reality for me this year, it was that the transcendent songs leapt off the page more than the albums. The sort of tracks I would put toe-to-toe -to -toe against any of my year-end lists, and they likely have a strong chance to beat them all, certainly in my top 10. But I'd argue it goes further. Oftentimes it felt like even if the album was not that that good, there were singular cuts that felt so special to the point where I found myself going back to the albums to check whether or not they wound up better than I remember just based off of those songs alone. That's really rare for me, especially when I've sat with an album and I've come to a pretty established conclusion, but that's how great certain songs were in 2022. And I feel obligated to mention that there is a lot of country on this list, as per usual, it's me, but the genre had a field day both independently and in the mainstream. And I'd also say that rap had a really strong year, especially in the indie scene, as well as a pretty solid balance of pop and indie rock. But more importantly, as I've said in the past, this is the list that always feels the most personal to me. But unlike last year, 2022 was a really good year. It leaves the tone of this list feeling kind of different. Euphoria and a feedback loop, huge positive emotions reinforced by their artistic counterparts. It's strange, almost an audacious feeling, but I kind of love it. But all right, no more wasting time. Let's get started with... Okay, maybe it doesn't start on a super positive note, but hey, if you want a song that actually captures the feeling of stewing and monotonous tension as the synths and guitars seethe before the chopping acoustics began ratcheting up against the lockstep drum machines, I do think it's this one. What I appreciate here beyond the terrific liquid guitar interplay and Emily Haynes cooing over the bridge before her husky rasp drops back in for the hook is that the song feels very lived in. It's abstracted, but it plays into the frustration of keeping it all buried under the service. In other words, for those who were appalled by a certain song so high on my list of the worst hit songs of 2022, at least for me, this is how you do it right. Jid is such an unbelievably strong rapper that there is a part of me that just kind of wants to marvel at how he careens off words and that pulsating bass and the shuddering trap beat switch and the football penalty flag samples that pick up a certain added resonance when you remember that Jid himself used to be a football player, a real athlete. And there is kind of a jock jam-esque quality to how the bars just keep beating you over the head. But the song is also smarter because Jid knows that he's inside a bad system that is both corrupted and doing exactly what it is designed to do, where he'll get slapped back if he unveils his true power, both physically and morally. Because it ain't just about rapping, it's kind of spiritual what he's trying to do. I'd argue he succeeds. I like to call myself the God of Rap, but really I just got a rap. <laughs> This a Dior doobie on the head of your cutie moon signs when you call her back. But you know, speaking of rappers who know that rapping itself could be its own spiritual fulfillment, here's the latest entry to this list and one that kind of shocked me how much it really stuck. Now, is it some of the DJ Premier's production and scratching that plays into Ab Soul's embrace of a lot of throwback battle bars? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Those keys, that horn sample, it's gonna work. But you know, Ab Soul's pile up of punchlines is married to some stakes that feel more tangible and personal this time. He mentions his suicide attempt and moving forward from it because his is a soul that is not about to leave just yet, especially as his late hype man stands as a guardian angel going forward probably not the only one. For as much as Absol's talent stands supreme, here it's rooted in a humanity that keeps him going, even as it is an artifice that places a target on his back. But you know, he's capable of ascension. This is probably his best song since Control System, and you know, even if I didn't love Herbert as an album, the song is fantastic. It's a freedom in admitting it's not gonna get better. Washing your hands of people you know forever. I'd be a liar if I feed surprise and go eat where it's tethered. Treat African proverbs like Vegas flyers. I float above the peasants. 
So uh, yeah, we're starting with a lot of dense, thoughtful hip hop, and we are not stopping just yet. Because at the penultimate moment of Ethiopes, Billy Woods delivers a devastating track, not just highlighting a personal moment of envy of those who actually achieve wealth in that system, and a fear that poverty will never let him see himself pass down that success, but then comes a real critique of generational wealth that's bound to make any hardcore capitalist second guess one's own principles in passing it down. But he's also not purely anti-capitalist either, because he's got some scathing words for all the internet socialists who are unable to inspire direct action in his second verse. And you know, even if they did, there's a very tangible risk of authoritarian takeover that he's seen globally, but of which they're rarely conscious. Cycles of history that do need to be considered. Also, the haunted, scratchy samples, the wailing vocals. God, it's heartbreaking to see the complicated failures of man, even if there's a freedom in believing that it might not get better. You could say it's all my fault We just couldn't get along And if anyone asks me, I'll say This song kind of floored me on first listen, and that's because I knew the context. Yeah, Amanda Shires' willowy vocals against the hollow keys, the aching strings, and that slow burn smolder of guitar, it had a ton of appeal right out of the gate. But when you know the song is all about the fractured relationship between her and her husband, Jason Isbell, of which he previously chronicled in some form across albums, especially 2020's reunions, and he plays guitar on that interlude, and you get to see the other side of the curtain to the word that he previously wrote. I mean, it's a devastating song, especially given that him being the more famous songwriter, most would not go to her for the more complicated truth, strip away the wings from the angels. I mean, the fact that their marriage survived in its wake, powerful stuff. Jesus loves the drunkards and the whores and the queers. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you recognize him if he bought you a beer? So remember when I said that certain albums were dragged to greatness on the back of some truly transcendent songs? Uh, yeah, this is a major case of such. With Ashley McBride recruiting Benji Davis to sketch out the misty night of a small town strip club, where you get more than a few glimpses at the folks who are on the very fringes who are still hoping for a vestige of grace. Or hell, just a joint, a downer, or a few dirty dollars that have been passed around town. I mean, it's a side of faith that, to be more honest, it has way more resonance than in a lot of more structured religious doctrine. It's grounded, it's tangible. There's this communal feeling where the spirit feels more present. And then coupled with some gorgeous production from John Osborne, it's just this phenomenal torch song. Even if we only get snippets of Ashley McBride herself here, but more on that later. And now for the much darker side of that simmer, and probably my favorite special interest song to date. And, and no, not just because it sounds like a long lost Savages song, although that definitely helps. No, 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 this is a brazenly political track on a global stage. The turning point of the album where we're after all the dance floor revelry, we get the darker edge that questions the colonization of the mind, where special interest wants you to confront how much we view the commodification of sex and love and relationships as just a product of living under late capitalism and the boot heels it enables overseas for you to live so well, even on the fringes. I mean, there's no promised land, a loaded line in both religious and colonial context, and this, the siren call, spur a challenge to it all. Yes, she still got a way, setting fire to this so hard, burning both ends of the bar. Okay, full disclosure, if the production was a little bit better and some of the higher frequencies were cleaned up, this would have been among my absolute favorites of 2022. It's still pretty high. And you know, while I can't call it Wade Bowen's best, he set a pretty damn high standard for himself. It's the warm, sad simmer of looking across a dive bar and seeing an ex of yours with a new partner. And you know for a fact that there's nothing else that you can possibly do. But there is still that lingering ember that he just has to reflect on 
So you gotta keep moving forward. And you know what, for what it's worth, the pianos, the lingering guitars, and that simply excellent snare pickup on this song, they're enough to get it up here. Just a phenomenal country song that got slept on by way too many. Worth looking up. And all these roads for the school that they go. And all these towns what a swore they fell down. But you know, speaking of phenomenal country songs that got slept on, Ian No's sophomore album contained many a story of folks that were struggling with time slipping away a little bit too fast around them, and this is probably my favorite of his in that lane specifically. A spare, organ-accented character portrait that picks up a borderline martial stomp as he traces the story of the veteran who deploys over and over again, even leaving behind family, and can never quite escape that calling and discipline that has left him Scarred and a little bit lost as the world tears past him, but he remains the same whenever that call arises. And what I really like about the song is how it's not really judging him for it. That sort of trudging stoicism, it's who he is. And while it absolutely takes a toll, there is a it's rather strange nobility that resonates from this. Not quite my favorite from the album, we'll get to that, but I went back to this more than I expected. It's worth a listen. Okay, so full disclosure, Soul Glow in 2022 is probably best discussed on a different list, but if there is a cut that surges above the rest, it's when they team up with Logi and McKinley Dixon for a slow crescendo of a jazz-inflected banger of insane potency. And while there is a level of creeping danger that builds up from the streets, there's also a very potent spiritual dimension here that goes beyond the radical politics and the anti-capitalist revolution that must come a calling, even acknowledging the rappers who would chase wealth at the expense of black power. McKinley Dixon in particular, with a little bit of a sly callback to For My Mama and anyone who looked like her from last year, I really appreciated that, questioning the danger of becoming angels. But you know what, on some level, some of that spiritual power just blasts through with the horns and that final hook that goes off insanely well, where the menace ignites into an inferno. Crazy shit kicks ass. We may run out of bullets. We're never gonna run out of hostages. This song might have one of my favorite lyrics of 2022 that very could have easily come out of the previous song. We have, may have run out of bullets, but we're never gonna run out of hostages. Now, of course, in John Darnielle's context, he's writing from a much more complicated point of view, where the entire song plays out like a hostage drama straight out of the late 80s or early 90s, complete with the echoing sweep of the guitars that eventually contribute to this fantastic outro. And what I really like about this track is that it leaves it mostly ambiguous where any morality falls if it factors in at all, whether or not the lead is more John Q or Hans Gruber or likely somewhere in between. But what he does know is that he's likely not going to get out of there alive. And it creates this bizarre sense of exultant freedom. And I mean, a little bit perverse given that main lyric. I mean, it's a tremendous, deceptively challenging song where you second guess every time you want to sing along or tweet that lyric, and I often have, but damn, it's effective. This thing was broke from the jump. No point going back and forth over who did what. My character all rolling loud to Shakespeare in the park and get stabbed. Stagger off in New York. I'm waiting in the wings, understudy every part. So in this case, at least part of this placing so high is because as I saw Billy Woods live this year, he, he did this song, and the line, this thing was broke from the jump, no point going back and forth over who did what, it stuck with me really hard. And the context of the heartbreak that underscores so much of church that Billy Woods could never quite escape, especially in the context of his own career where you can see echoes of new cycles forming that he's now questioning, juxtaposed against the aftermath of revolutions that he's seen, and a world that never quite looks the same after that. The funeral, organ-inflected, shambling sadness of the hook just cuts so deeply. Where amidst the cheap snacks, expensive weed, and an even more expensive booze, the hope for hoes in paradise is both earnest but also revealing of genuine pain. I've always said Billy Woods is most powerful for me when he doesn't just wind around a lot of abstract paranoia, even if he's amazingly good at it. But it gets to an incredibly textured, raw humanity. This was his best portrait of the year. Bar none. 
Yeah, to the surprise of nobody, Ethel Kane is going to be on this list a bunch, and Thoroughfare is a goddamn tour de force in her own right. The song is huge and sprawling like the Americana that her character transverses, a windswept expanse entrenched in the American westward gaze that's baked into the country's history and iconography, where the harmonica simmers and the acoustics creak as the drums build up, and Ethel Kane's burnished tones cut through the mist before the guitars erupt forth. I feel not nearly enough attention has been given to the fact that Ethel Kane produced this entire album herself. But what I love is the balance of this song. You get traces of that bridge with that the man that she's traveling with is eventually going to treat her badly when they get to California and well the album goes there and so far beyond. But there is a yearning to the framing of the song that just gets me. She wants to believe and the song soars to match that power. Uh, again it's not my favorite of hers but as an album centerpiece it's breathtaking. And if it didn't rain at the perfect time, it's probable we wouldn't have kissed. In the Northeast, Minneapolis Arts District. So this is a considerably more restrained song, and arguably that's one of the reasons it feels so special to me. Adeem the artist paints such a grounded, believable picture of a cafe scene in Minneapolis with a partner during Pride, and while there is some religious iconography and metaphor interlaced through it, I mean, you title a song for Judas and lean on a lot of the biblical and queer angles simultaneously, you're gonna draw some attention, but that's not how the song feels. Feels. It's just a very believable, low-stakes, queer love story where the betrayal left a sting, but I deem the artist still has some wistful, fond memories, especially with the roots of their art entangled within it. And with the pianos, the gentle guitars, the percussion, it almost feels like a lost singer-songwriter cut from the early 90s with such a low-key normal charm of which such queer stories have often been denied. I, I just really love that a deem the artist traced that story in this way anyhow. I think that's the magic. Oh, we just in the same dreams I had when I was 19. When I was 19. When I was 19. When I was 19. Oh, we just in the dream. Oh, God damn it. Def Havana just know how to write songs that hit me like a ton of bricks. In this case, looking back on the last tumultuous decade and openly questioning if their old rock star dreams are still the main priority, especially jaded with years of frustrations and setbacks. I mean, on some level, it feels like an old rock and roll survivor song you occasionally saw from a bunch of old veterans who saw their peers perish or burn out or fade away on the road, but combine that with the past couple years of plague, mortality is in sharp relief, and Def Havana are gonna rend themselves asunder, questioning all those dreams as the guitars spark and roar off the keys, and this overcompressed, surging mix. Again, this album is one good producer away from being transcendent. And in the meantime, god damn, this goes so hard. giving the 1975 a pass for making the best song Lionel Richie never made, all about a love that's probably oversold and too desperate for its own damn good? Well, uh, yeah, probably. But when the piano has bounced off the textured bounce of one of the best rollicking grooves that Jack Antonoff has ever produced, even before the saxophone creaks in, and Matt Healy sounds convincingly earnest. I mean, there's something very late period bleachers about some of the flagrant 80s influences and the subtle rawness of which I'm not complaining. And yeah, I'm all the way there with this. I mean, plus there is something about Matt Healy complaining about a bad experience with cuckoldry that did make me snicker. But then I actually realized he made me care enough about his feelings that the song worked regardless. I think he wound up winning here. God damn it. Here it is, a heart is cut. A 
Okay, no, it's not entirely Mike the Snare's influence or fault that this is on my list. It comes down to me doing it at karaoke and realizing that it absolutely goddamn slaps, if, if I didn't know it already. The funny thing is that, outside of the obvious, it's kind of tough to pin down why this works so well in comparison with other Spoon songs. The lyrics mostly flit around a lot of abstract, swaggering, going out and kicking ass no matter what anyone says vibes, where there is a sense of indeterminate danger that is echoed by the menace of the clattering percussion and those clipped bluesy grooves that build up a lot more sparking embellishments that lead into that solo. But I mean, let's be real. This song, it's on this list for that sizzling post-chorus riff. It makes the song in every way, kicks a ton of ass, goddamn rocks. Now she's living on a road map. People don't change people talk. Man, I wish that Wombat's album was better. But again, call it a case of an album elevated by a few fantastic songs, and this was the real standout for me all year. A cyclical guitar melody and killer groove that simmers around this lingering, frustrated disillusionment, where there's still a hint of the old glamour, but it's been tempered by failure and the stark reality that you can't really change people. Only time can do that, and everything that comes with it. Frankly, it's just way more cynical than I would normally endorse, especially coming from this band. But there is something about a desire to keep on trying and miss everything that's set to ground you down, especially opposite some very harsh awareness of your own limitations. I mean, I don't know, maybe some of that old spirit and optimism and desperate flair will erupt forth, and the bridge seems like it could give a snapshot of what could be. And hell, making one of the catchiest indie rock songs of 2022. That sure as hell helps. And on the topic of hope, you know, if it wasn't for a slightly dicey vocal mix, this would be even higher on my list. As Ashley McBride calls in Kaylee Hammock, Pillbox Patty, and Brandy Clark for a stellar fireside sing-along so they can cut loose and throw daggers at the jackasses who would pit them against each other in a small town and brand them as bitches if they unite. It's a moment of penultimate solidarity that McBride gets has to feel huge, even despite every rough edge that she lets erupt forth. So the country politan strings rise around the electric sizzle, and the song feels like the proper musical climax point I had been yearning for the entire album. And man, they just cut loose. If you follow country, you know just how much all these women have likely deserved better in the industry. A note of subtext that burns all the hotter here, and you get hints of the vocal runs that they are capable of by that final hook, and I can't imagine how huge this will sound live with everyone on board. Just an incredible moment. Still not my favorite from the album. We'll get to that. I lit a smoke then I threw my coat in the chair where she used to sit. Ain't that about as lonesome as it gets. From the solidarity, we get a lonely post-breakup musing that would be bitter as all hell if it wasn't laugh out loud funny, and Ian No got that balance impeccably. What I like that he does here, beyond just the understated mix and knowing that all he really needs for this composition to work is play as hangdog and traditional as he can, especially with that pedal steel and the very lonely solo, is that there are so many homespun, intimate details where Ian No just feels a bit detached and adrift from the larger world in the face of that that breakup, little conveniences he's acutely now aware he's missing in his life, and it spills into his art and he can't even write about it. So audibly bored and lonely, and it translates into this weirdly cathartic moment when he gets drunk and he burns down his Christmas tree. I mean, it's kind of unbelievably charming and a little bit too real, and that's kind of why I adore it. It sounds timeless, like an undiscovered standard. If we're lucky in indie country, maybe it can become one. Oh 
shut up. Even the people who didn't like Love Sucks thought this song ruled, and they were right. This was everything that we wanted from a return to pop punk for Avril Lavigne. Now, I'm still plenty annoyed just how many people turned on this after the collected ignoring of everything that she made when she actually did try to grow up and get more mature, only for her to get scolded this time for not growing up. I mean, I could highlight how most of those folks still worship the washed up male rock stars and rappers who are considerably more immature and dated for it. But who really cares if the song is immature when she can actually sell that? And she can. She's got more convincing attitude and intensity than the majority of the field, to say nothing of a frankly ridiculous vocal range. It's one of the few songs where Travis Barker's production gives her a tune to work with, and she at least seems smart enough to acknowledge a bad relationship that didn't really work, even if her ex didn't get it. So yeah, the song rules. It should have been huge everywhere in 2022. I stand by that. Hey, you know what? Sometimes the obvious lead-off single actually works. The terrific blur of percussion building off the wells of strings and pianos and backing vocals. The hook that just goddamn soars from Dave LaPepe. And even as time whirls past him, he's trying to grapple with the man that he now wants to be in the face of his father's passing. My favorite line on this song comes from the bridge. So take a single step, at a simple pace, and the outward momentum will maybe unfuck you in time. If that's not a perfect line, untangle the messy process of grief. I, I don't know what is. Now, obviously, y'all know there is more gang of use coming, but if you need an easy as hell introduction to this group, I think this will do it. Sometimes there is a blast of relief at knowing that you are actually screwing up, potentially wrecking your life in slow motion, but you feel you can kind of control it. It throws any sense of judgment out the window, especially if you are just unapologetic, clear-eyed. You know exactly how much damage you can do to everything. It's euphoric in a bizarrely captivating manner. You're going down swinging. And that's kind of what Def Havana tap into with Going Clear. It's as anthemic as they have ever been, and it almost kind of feels feels wrong with those clarion tones echoing over the mix and the chugging bass and the reflections on how if this is really all over maybe they don't want to be sober for that moment and fuck i can't judge them for that especially when it goes this hard it's not healthy but art rarely is especially like this i'll take it we've been selling off our books and records It should be common knowledge that the order of a list like this can often fluctuate, often wildly throughout the course of a year, and unless you've got that top of the line standout, of which I've got a couple this year, you could easily swap songs by a specific artist back and forth and it wouldn't really matter all that much. This is the case for books and records, of which on some given days I'd say is the best song from White Trash Revelry, with all that warm pedal steel and the gentle acoustic grooves and the anti-capitalist weariness where they have had to sell off what they love, but they are hopeful they'll be able to buy it all back at some point. But as it is... Well, we'll see. But if you're looking for a tremendously rewarding deep cut from a Deem the Artist, I point to this as a real favorite. Push the fucking pack off of the porch or break a pound down. Get the scrap if it happened to blow, it makes a round sound. Pussy cat on my lap, push it back and go to town now. Putting rap on my back and I'm black and snatching crown. So I view it as a categorical failure of Billboard Dreamville and the listening public at large that this song was not a smash hit in 2022. It goddamn deserved to be. Would that this have been what most people know Jid for and not Enemy? I mean, the collage of samples, the great swing of the low key trap hook where Jid proves that he could play that game, but after the beast switch then smirkingly eats everybody's lunch in the bassy darkness, that brief Baby Tate segment that left me wanting more, and of course, 21 Savage. If you want the reason I was so angry with her loss, it's because you can very obviously tell that 21 put more effort into one verse here than he did with anything on that album with Drake. Now, I do think Jid got the best line by saying he turned to a rapper ironically. I mean, he's smart enough to do anything he wants, but he also knows to work within the current system to disseminate his message. 
this is a way to do it. But again, not quite done with Jid yet. Stay tuned. So I wouldn't normally put a very obvious cover on my year-end list, especially of a classic song. It feels like cheating, even if the cover is top of the line with fantastic harmonies like this is. But I also can't deny that the moment I heard this coming onto my stereo listening to the album last fall, I didn't look at the track list, and yet that sheer feeling of surprise and euphoria I got listening to that note-perfect moment one of the best moments with music that I had all goddamn year. It comes at the perfect place on the album, it fits in seamlessly, the vocal arrangement is stellar, the production is perfect to nail this vibe. I honestly don't know how in good conscience I could exclude this. Call it cheating, I don't care. Best cover of the year, you should probably hear it. She's so soft like silk chiffon. I think I first reviewed this song in 2021, but it was on Muna's self-titled album this year, It Counts, and I think it took this long to properly finally sink in as a stellar pop song, even if the pure sapphic bliss of the cut is not something I will ever share. But the joy here, the 90s and 2000s pop rock rollick that comes with the warping touches, the brighter acoustics and how Phoebe Bridgers doesn't really work at all in the song, but that's kind of the magic anyway. She's a little bit too downbeat and depressed, it's still all a little bit too real, but she's being tugged along into this joyous expanse, and there is a part of her that desperately wants to believe it can work for her too, even if she can't sell it. It's pushing out of the comfort zone of irony into something that's genuinely sincere, and it's charming as all hell. I mean, it's kind of sacrilegious, but I'm fairly certain this is the most I have liked either act at any point. Point. Just a wonderful song. Rich nigga, broke phone. Trying to keep the balance, I'm staying strong. Stop playing with me before I turn you to a song. Stop playing with me before I turn you to a song. This is a case of what stuck with me. I really wanted to say We Cry Together is the better song with the Florence and the Machine sample and the uncomfortable realness, but it wasn't really a track I revisited as much as this. Kendrick Lamar's slow burn melodic rap song with the haunted chords, Sam Dew's echoing vocals, and the shuddering bass backing up that snap beat. I mean, there's still a part of me that's convinced that Vince Staples could slip onto a remix of the song. It would make perfect sense. But the great thing with this track is just how well it serves as a check on the ego. Kendrick Lamar is flexing on the song, make no mistake, but it's pruning back on a lot of the things in his life that don't matter, trying to find something real, and that demands a different style of flexing altogether. The growth is coming in spirit, and while you can absolutely ask questions surrounding what the ramifications of how this internal growth will manifest on record, on an individual track it's absolutely stellar. Every year for me needs a couple great brooding songs. This was a big one. So get out of my Take your heart with you And all those things that were never mine anyway I'm still kind of stunned that Brett Eldridge actually made this at all. On the one hand, it is vintage country soul, the sort of song that he's got no trouble selling whatsoever because he's basically overflowing with natural charisma, lucky son of a bitch. Now, on the other hand, it's the sort of blunt breakup song that I'm kind of stunned that he attempted to make at all, where it's otherwise framed so cheery with the gentle patter of the percussion and that brighter guitar rollick that you almost don't notice how mean the track can be. Now, I think some of my fondness for this comes down to really the sheer odd audacity of this thing, but at the same time, it is kind of a fantastic mature breakup song that really does come from someone at their absolute wit's end, and Brett Eldridge has just enough of a light touch to really make it really click. I kind of get how it wouldn't work for a lot of folks. Again, it's kind of wild how some of his best songs were so sour this year, but for me, god damn it worked. Flash a smile while the traffic slows. This is a 
Sloan that lives and dies on the performance of Orville Peck because, also after a fashion, it's a breakup song. But the sort that's coaxed through with a lot of rich, burnished tones and swells of echoing guitar, the sort set against a lot of golden sunrises and a vast expanse of roadway where the faint snap and every vocal ah, has its own little flair. But there is a part of me that's so enamored with the roguish charm of the track. Orville Peck is self-deprecating, but you can also tell everything is on its way out. It's time to hit that next road ahead. And man, that honeyed vocal just sounds so stellar. Not gonna lie, it became a karaoke staple for me as well. And if there's a song that's designed to blow the doors off any place that doesn't expect it, it's this one. What a tune. Nobody expected this to be good. Hell, I'm fairly certain this was critically savage before it was even released. And even then, this was not the song that really attracted a lot of attention. A and yeah, that's kind of a shame because Hole in My Head rides its own burnished acoustic Americana and gauzy synths into a scene that very swiftly flips from nostalgic yearning into something that's grittier and rougher, where a lot of those innocent, older times become corrupted across the reality of tours, both music and military. Not always sure that's a great parallel to be drawn, on. There is a song later on this list that kind of hits these notes a little better. I'd even say Ian No does. But when Yellow Wolf starts howling on that hook, it's stunning how magnetic it feels. Even before Shooter Jennings lets the keyboards and the oily guitars flood into that mix. I'd also call this an example of an individual song transcending a mediocre album. But that project was way better than it got any amount of credit. This was just a shining example of what could be delivered. And the album was good. Give it another chance. Okay, even Canada's charts screwed up not letting this become a proper hit. It actually charted over here and just never got proper traction beyond a few weeks. Likely because the weekend's guess verse that it's here at all. But this should have been huge. The sort of glassy, futuristic R&B coaxed through waves of shuddering auto-tune and quaking bass that showed just how well FKA Twigs could command this atmosphere even mid-breakdown. And while it could come across a bit sketchy as the weekend encroaches into this, FK Twigs knows exactly what she's doing in using and discarding him. I'm not sure how the fuck it's as therapeutic as he croons, but it's what she needs in this moment, and her vocals remain as stunning as ever. Coupled with the fact that the song is rammed through with so many subtle melodic hooks, the public was deprived of something extraordinary with this. I blame everybody. Okay, if you want a prime example of a song so obviously transcending everything it came from, it's this one from Alex Cameron, which might be the most frighteningly real portrait of being way too online as a creator that I heard all year. And there's a lot that I can highlight beyond just that central conceit. The horns sound great, the hook's insanely catchy, the groove is rock solid, the nascent, seedy, soft rock vibe doesn't feel as undercooked as the rest of the album. But what I love the most here is that Alex Cameron doesn't frame himself as having Having all of the answers when he's online. If anything, he's sprawling across the web trying to fish for a reaction to seem interesting and present the best possible version of himself. Sometimes that's at cross purposes and nothing can prepare you for the sort of ego death that comes with realizing that not only do you not have universal appeal, fewer folks care than you realize. I mean, it's a gut punch of a song and one that I also relate to a little bit too much, but hey, there is some breezy relief in that realization and in a year where things actually got better? Oh, fuck the irony. I'm rolling with this. Nights get longer Days get hard I learned to put a bullet through the middle of a heart I learned to put a bullet through the middle of a heart 
okay, there is a part of me that wanted to be the contrarian and say, no, 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 Adeem the Artist had better songs than this. And Reclaim My Name is better. I'm going to stand proudly on that hill. But Middle of a Heart is so goddamn excellent that even the folks that wanted to disparage them for a lot of stupid reasons couldn't help but acknowledge this song. The gentle acoustics, the subtle sound design touches that foretell where that protagonist will go, the moral ambiguity and very plain lack of judgment in the framing for the kid who wants to provide for his family and serve his country no matter the cost. Patriotism always demands a cost. All centered around that gun that echoes across United States iconography. Again, like the best of country music, it feels damn near timeless. And that final chorus in particular sends a shiver down my spine every single time. And now that a deem the artist is properly here, they can break so many hearts anew. Whereas on the flip side, this is a huge symphonic power metal song with some glorious 80s inspired synths where Bob Catley once again steps up for the huge assist, just like he did back in 2019 for Lavender. And hell, I would argue that the album this comes from is even better than Moonglow. This song is a prime example. The production feels more burnished, a little bit more refined. Tobias Sammet's vocals are better than ever. The hook is glorious, especially as the twinkling magic shimmers up around them with the full strings burning bursting into that major key interlude that feels so goddamn triumphant. Where if Tobias was looking to create some rather epic magic, I think he succeeded in spades. Now, too many folks do not take Avantasia all that seriously, and yeah, I get it, but if you're willingly choosing yourself to deprive yourself of this sort of fun, that's on you. This rules. I laid the groundwork and then, just like clockwork, the dominoes cascaded in a line. What if I told you I'm a master? Taylor Swift growing up and embracing a more complicated moral ambiguity is by far the best thing that's happened to her writing in recent years. And while this isn't the most pop accessible version of that, we'll get to it, as a concluding track, Mastermind is glorious. I love how she admits how she did pursue her partner and then highlighted the messy rationale and explanation behind it as the keys will shimmer amidst the strings and the song picks up its pace. Powerful women have had to behave shrewdly to maintain their power or else they become pawns in the game. And when you realize that so much of Taylor Swift's calculation is rooted in desperation for genuine human connection, despite her wealth and her power, I don't know, even if that in and of itself is calculated, I felt it. But of course, the best moment is when Swift discovers that her partner knew all along what she was doing, and she wasn't approaching someone to dominate, but an equal that matches her. And that sense of raw joy, yeah, especially this year, it stuck. I mean, I praise this song time and time again. It thoroughly deserves it. I'm doing this for revenge. I'm doing this to try and stay true. I'm doing this for the ones they had to leave behind. I'm doing this for you. It's kind funny that most folks, including myself, tend to focus on John Darnielle's intricate skills as a songwriter, but sometimes he chooses to remind us all that his music can kick so much ass. Rain and Soho, of course, that is the top tier, but training montage overwhelmingly succeeds thanks to the killer crescendo, Darnielle's holler, the fact that it literally sounds like it could soundtrack a mid-tier guys movie training montage with a rough guitar rattle that erupts into some hammering smolder, and the fact that he knows so much of these conflicts are rooted in a lot of old school vengeance. And, and yeah, the album is going to deconstruct the hell out of that sentiment, but you need to set the stage. Man, he delivers. This is probably the loosest and most natural the Mountain Goats have sounded in kicking ass just in years. I bought it all the way down. It's a banger. Whatever happened to the girl I knew in the wasteland Come up short and end up on the news. I don't know if this is the most 
pathetic Josh Tillman has allowed himself to be on record. Unlike a lot of acts, I think I'd have to make a list to figure that one out. But even if you're looking for an even harsher deconstruction of modern machismo than Darnell, uh, Josh Tillman might have it with this one. I mean, he himself has described this as directed at a potential daughter who'd move past their father after he gets out of prison and then tries to reconnect, which kind of gets all sorts of warped when you realize that Lana Del Rey covered this song, and I don't even want to want to touch on the subtext there, especially when that girl has now well, become everybody's girl. But that's the thing. As the song proceeds with that gorgeous saxophone and the burnished old school 70s production, you realize she's just fine in her life. He's the one who's trying to undermine her and whatever principle she has, where he's trying to assert authority and he's failing spectacularly. Or even if he goes back to the bar full of the old timers, they won't even believe a single word he says. It's almost kind of sad how profound the yearning for connection feels, be it hers or his. And in the case of another album being dragged up by its absolute best, yeah, Father John Misty nailed that one too. Don't think about that turn of phrase too hard. She had Billy Eilish style Moving to Berlin for a little while Trying to find something to hold on to she had Billie Eilish style. This might be one of the most quotable songs of the year amidst a certain part of online indie fandom. And man, I get it. It's probably Black Country New Road's most accessible song, but damn near their best. It's another breakup song. I'm a little bit stunned how many of them showed up on this list. I guess I may have been processing some shit from earlier the past couple of years, but as the horns, the guitars, the synths they continue to build, Isaac Wood tries to process seeing his long-term dreams implode trying to accept that it's clearly over, even despite some mingled feelings of antipathy and love and a cavalcade of references that are both opulent, nerdy, and ridiculous. But I get it especially as the song gets all the more cacophonous and Wood starts howling. I mean, if I am going to quote that titular movie, you don't know about real loss, because it only occurs when you've loved something more than you love yourself. If that doesn't sum up the tempest here, I don't know what does. You know, in a paradoxical way, speaking of not loving yourself, this might be Taylor Swift's best single from any album. It's certainly up there. The shuffling pad of the percussion as the shuddering but twinkling synth melody flushes out some of that atmosphere with Taylor Swift's overwritten lyrics that are as sharp as they are idiosyncratic down to the bones. It is utterly bizarre to me that this song has become a massive hit. Swift writing about getting older but never wiser, racked by her own paranoia and her own schemes, where she's very consciously aware of how her reputation precedes her to then crush everything in its path, where even her death will not be sacred for those who want what she has more than wanting her. But she also knows she did it all to herself is narcissism disguised as altruism and how it didn't really fool anyone paying attention. And the kind of person she is can be just a little exhausting, especially when any real self-awareness fails to manifest. She puts lip service, but how much is that? In other words, it's another song I've talked about in some form time and time again, and it's so acutely relatable in ways I did not expect. Likely not healthy, but hey, I've known I'm the problem for a long damn time. So I said fine Cause that's how my daddy raised me If they strike once and you just hit them twice as hard There are songs nearly every goddamn year where it's just too much for me to say anything. It cuts that deep. I, I did not expect it would wind up being this in the end, but between Ethel Kane's husky delivery, the grand horn accented buildup, and the sweep of the song balanced against the religious angst, where amidst the rest of the album building to a grisly moment, we get a snap back to childhood, and some of the most utterly devastating lines on the entire record. Yeah, it gets there. Let's 
lighten the mood a bit. With a song that seemed to split music critic consensus right down the middle, with lyrics half crafted from AI and the other half seemingly from batshit insanity, all wiry, jagged synth grooves and unearned bombast as Jonathan Higgs strains his voice to the absolute limit to just bellow through the song, especially by the end. But that's the point. This is a song that's running on arrogance and delusion, where posturing that's both ridiculous and pathetic, but really it's the only thing you have, so you're gonna go for broke. And if that's not both a trauma response and a searing indictment of internet culture, I don't know what is. I mean, it was a toss-up between this and, well, that other big Everything Everything song that's on this list that would attain the higher spot. We're getting to it. But I think you should ignore those who dismiss this as a shallow, overbaked meme. That's the point. That's why it works. That's why this rules. And if you're thinking about dropping the line, tell them I'm back on Southern time to the city of gold. And baby, I'm told that Josie is doing just fine. So a bit of a personal note, my favorite karaoke DJ in my city has nearly every Orville Peck song that I want to sing on a regular basis, except this one. And it drives me nuts because it's his most spare, stripped down cut and he finds absolute gold against the acoustics and touches of pedal steel for what's borderline a torch song. We get a departure where they have both clearly moved on, but there's something of a lingering spark and we get why Orville Peck might linger. He's getting older, more world weary. He's hoping for one last trace of that spark after getting burned so many times. So he's dropping that one last line to hope his lover can pick up and they might be able to rekindle something. It's just such a lovely, plain spoken song that's transcended in its straightforward purity. A slept on deep cut, to be sure. It might be the best thing he's ever done. This is one of two songs in my top 10 that I actually reviewed solo on my Instagram and TikTok before I even thought of covering the album. And I was kind of wary about Jid settling into his fame, only to realize amidst the swampy, brittle acoustics and the warped swing of the groove, with the echoing chant vocal and the brisk hi-hat, we're seeing the steep cost of that fame play out. Not just in blood, but in the realizations of what he can really do to help his community when there's a steep limit on his influence. Because while he can constantly get back, the lingering temptations, the dangers of the rapper lifestyle hang heavy. This isn't a prosperity gospel as he bends across accents and horn flourishes and the endlessly playful bars that can't escape that menace. This is a sacrilege. He's just trying to ride the beat and survive. After all, he made that deal and Kenny Mason's layered harmonies echo it. I mean, I don't, I didn't expect it. I think this is my favorite rap song of the year. I feel like it's a cheat code with Def Havana in this formula. They make a self-flagellating anthem that's borderline of toxic, where they lay it all bare, they seem to expect they're gonna get dumped in the wake, where there is just a tease that some sort of love might linger. Gets me every goddamn time. I mean, Sinner was my favorite song of 2018. It played that formula. And while this doesn't quite have that same sort of grand magic, there is something about getting smothered and roiling guitars, the drippy blur of drum machines coursing into the live drums and then how the choppy riffs crash in after that pause on the bridge damn near perfection and if this really is Def Habana's final project and swan song oh fuck what a way to go out Yeah, just teased it a while ago, you all knew this was coming. The other Everything Everything song where Jonathan Higgs confesses his love to a computer. Well, only half literally. While there is a glorious sense of wonder at the computer and everything it can do that's beyond a lot of human comprehension that plays out in the wonky synths and the stuttering groove and the grandly silly chorus and that warbling guitar solo, he also gets that this computer can be both deeply dangerous but also a slave to the programming that we give it. This is 
framing that when Bastille tried something that, like this earlier in 2022, they couldn't quite pull it off, because it doesn't exactly speak to a great future ahead, and Higgs knows that. But again, for someone looking for any way to escape, there is a desperate thrill in charging into this Technicolor world, and everything, everything just owns that weird vibrancy, and I believe it from them. I think this was the song and the moment that properly convinced me that raw data feel was something special. I could finally start appreciating everything, everything. I might not be in love with this future, but the present delivered something special. I'd like to plan out my part in this, but you're such a narcissist. You'll probably do it next week. This might be the biggest surprise of 2022 for me, in both the artist and the fact that Lizzie McAlpine could pull off such a theatrical masterwork. Now, Doomsday is absolutely melodramatic. The breakup it's framed as death, an apocalypse even. But that actually kind of makes sense when you realize apocalypse, it's a word rooted in revelation, where despite very real feelings, she's now going to make a plan for how she's going to handle getting dumped in a blur of sarcasm, but very real pain, which just erupts on the bridge for a glorious trembling bit of honesty. I mean, the bridge takes us to a different stratosphere. It's insane. And the music builds to it. The darker acoustics, the shuddering percussion building off the haunted lockstep off that piano as McAlpine's vocal line will bend across major and minor keys. A bit of a 90s influence there where the tension simmers and roils, where the defenses can only hold for so long before it all breaks apart. Just a stellar out of nowhere album opener that Again, one of the biggest surprises all damn year. Well, maybe except for one thing. She's back. She did it. I I'm breaking my rules that a song had to be on an album I covered in 2022 because what I can tell, this might be a standalone single. It's not going to make the album plan for next year. I could be wrong. But even if that gets changed and this gets tacked on as a bonus track, I reviewed this on IG and TikTok. It, it counts. It's everything I wanted Pink to make for over a decade. It's her best song since the 2000s, easily among the tier of her best in that era. And while I could just easily praise her for going back to the raw pop rock that I've loved from her as the guitars will shed their layers of effects to pick up real fire, it, it went further. Because this song was released in the wake of the repeal of Roe v. Wade. And I saw a lot of tangible backlash to Pink going political, because apparently the imbeciles never listened to a Pink album 15 to 20 years ago. But what I think really stings here is that Pink is in her 40s, and the weariness of the systems and rights that she fought for now being dismantled, and then being told that she and women around her are irrelevant in their genuine rage. I mean, I watched American News. That line of reasoning was all over the mainstream coverage of the repeal of Roe v. Wade in the run-up to the midterms. Let's not rewrite history because a lot of people said it would not matter, but it was a blast of anthemic catharsis that by pop and rock radio stridently ignoring it, it proves her point in spades. Because there's not a shred of ironic attachment or deflection here. It's rage and the truth that a lot of the kids feel the same, but they won't scream it out. I mean, call it corny, call it oversold, pretend you're too goddamn cool. That doesn't actually change shit. Some of us have lived through that before. Pink got it. And while I can't pretend to hope that all of that next album will follow in the wake, I mean, we can hope, right? Because this was amazing. Of all the songs that made my year end list in 2022, I, I did not expect this one to become so highly acclaimed outside of me. Now granted, when you make a soaring synth inflected pop rock banger where it feels like notes were being mixed from Journey and Taylor Swift alike, I, I get the universal appeal. But even Ethel Kane feels a little weird that this song wound up among Barack Obama's favorites in 2022. And that's all the more weird because this song is spinning in the face of that American dream. Not so much that it's a a lie, but that it's a crushing truth that's only afforded to some while leaving others stranded alone scrabbling in the desperate hope to achieve it. An individualized narrative and hierarchy that if you're on the outside looking in, you can't help but see everything, 
even the horrific consequences. Feels like a jock jam where the jock who can't make the college team enlists and dies. Where she's melting down in the bleachers and at the pep rally she drinks the blackout and she prays for a salvation that always feels out of reach and that she's still so alone. But she keeps on yearning hoping against hope. And even if it doesn't represent much of what's to come on Preacher's Daughter, it doesn't. It is still an anthem for a generation. And what could possibly be better? Come find me. I'm here today but don't belong. I'm working till the dead is gone. The upside of it. The upside of it. I mean, I don't think this is a surprise that to anyone, this is my favorite song of 2022. A magnificent tour de force, the album centerpiece from Gang of Youths at a point of glorious revolutionary power where Dave Lopepe takes the complicated immigrant story of his father and he makes it cinematic. And the workaday struggles that can't steal away those dreams. The poverty, the struggle, it is palpable. The inability to cut into his debts and every job will rob him of a little bit more as he tries to save enough to send back home to his family and when situations inevitably got worse he wonders what postcard to send home to his family that of the potential wondrous new world or the brutal unfair reality of state-sanctioned exploitation and the music captures that chaotic ongoing struggle the vocal swell the near breakbeat percussion the driving piano keys driving up the strings the pedal tone of the guitars on the second verse that opens up to what sounds like sleigh bells on the second hook and that bridge my god, the melodic interplay, it, it floors me every time. This is the sort of song you only feel like you hear every couple of years. The sort of track that doesn't just pull its album into transcendent territory, but it leaves you wondering if there's anything that could even compete. The first time I heard this, I listened to it about five or six more times in rapid succession. I don't do that outside of the context of an album. You need to create something that's utterly wondrous to pull that off. And Gang of Youths did. So yeah, best song of 2022. It's not close. And if there's anything that can match this in the foreseeable future, forget 2023. The world will be better for it. You might even see the upside of it. But yeah, before then, thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I would be extremely grateful. Once again, leave your list of your favorite songs of the year down in the comments below. I know it's a long video. I'm happy for all you who actually stuck around. Beyond that, though, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. If you want to help support the channel, link to beyond my merch in the description below. Link to my Patreon is right over there. Don't feel obligated. Tough times, I understand. But if you want to get argue, if you want to argue with me on my Discord, or help add albums to my schedule in the upcoming year, or just support the channel, options available. Till then, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.